the piece, how many was how many times was pure. So how we can uh, how can I say um, taking advantage the expression of the process and in in a way don't have an, a representation of a representation. Uh, eliminate the representation of, of, of the ideas and go very direct to the object. Um, and then we took an advantage, the translucency of the porcelain, of the material, and we created these uh, um, lighting arranges. And there you can see a little dot of something uh, dark. That little dot, uh, that little dot is a little chunk of volcanic lava. Here is we realize where uh, that the volcanic lava get melted at the same point that the porcelain gets strong. So again, uh, we were thinking in, para in temperature parameters, we realized that the uh, material can be uh, part of the process. So here we were looking some uh, and something uh, that uh, in the composition, get part of the of the of the anchor point of the hanging point of the components that is uh, and uh, then we realized that the lava get melted uh, here's some pieces that are important for us for example this one is part of the collection of the metropolitan museum Dale. Um, now we are so if you want to explain this we're working in a uh, huge plates in, and we have uh, realized that when we make this kind these size of pieces we can uh, detach the um, the fabric the clothes, and we have to uh, get into the kill together so if we make this we have this kind of drops uh, outside the the piece and we <laughs> Again, we start to find uh, we find some new expression on the process that we are making. So, quiero decir algo más? No, dale. Um, well, we, we are in a studio and many things are happening at the same time. And when we were working on it. Uh, on this kind of things, we 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 had some uh, very old 3D printer that never printed well, so it pushed us to create at that time our own way to print, and we we realized that that glitch can be a known expression of the 3D printer, and we worked on this uh, kind of academic project called Dysgraphia, and maybe. It, this may be vintage right now because this is this may be eight years ago we were working on this trying to print direct from grasshopper and over there what we made was uh, we could uh, control any engine of the 3d printer and we also put a kind of noise on the coast in order to create this expression where we can find some uh, new things and the first, uh, <laughs> the first created piece was the this graphia man. Then we create this kind of piece where you can see uh, the kind of catenary printer, this kind of texture too. And maybe you can start really. Yeah. So more than the if this is a super technological or not technological project, the important thing here, I believe. Uh, that is um, um, the, 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 the new technologies are new tools, are just new tools that they has their own expression and they allow us to make some things, not everything. So um, here we wanted to say basically that the, the 3D printer has their own expression and uh, we amplify that expression uh, controlling the, the engines of the printer, the feed rate of the machine, um, the, the temperature uh, at what uh, uh, the, temp the melting temperature. So you can see more things that just, uh, just an object created in a perfect way. You can see uh, the expression of the, the, the process as, as the same as we wanted to, to make it in the process uh, of the like, catenary pottery printer. So here, um, as here, uh, basically we combine two projects, uh, 
turn back one, please. Uh, the, the chair you can see there is a project uh, where we realized that we can make uh, that we can melt uh, volcanic lava and we develop a, a, a process a, also a parametric process but physical one in order to control the uh, the expression of the lava through the uh, through the temperature uh, parameters uh, like the color like the uh, smoothness uh, and many other parameters and uh, we thought that we can uh, mix both techniques and we cr uh, and try to create uh, our own uh, stone 3D printing process. So we started doing this, uh, basically uh, melt, um, doing exactly the same process uh, we did for remolten, but we started doing the uh, proof concepts uh, using syringe. It's basically, here you can see the process. Uh, it's a... Uh, powder paste uh, with uh, some um, bound, uh, binder, sorry. Uh, it's a, an organic binder. Uh, it's a, actually it's a, a molassa uh, that can be mixed uh, with the with the uh, rock powder. And we create this paste and that paste can be extruded. Dale, sigue. Uh, dale. So then we put that, that model inside the kiln and then we st started studying all the temperature parameters uh, in order to find exactly the one that uh, allow us to become in stone the piece again. There you can see some green ones that are created, uh, that are mixed with, uh, um, ay, ¿cómo se dice? With a, with a basalt, yes, with basalt uh, from the, the, our central region. Don't know exactly why the 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 the, the green color comes out. So we are still researching about that. It's like uh, the cat poo. <laughs> uh, so here you can see exactly the same piece uh, with uh, different temperatures. So and 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 it's incredible to find uh, new expressions for a stone that we have never seen before uh, artificially. Perhaps we can see this kind. Of this kind of expressions in a volcano, but do not control it in a way. Dale, uh, how we can uh, attach three pieces fired in different times together. Dale, sí. uh, or simple planes uh, in, in uh, printings uh, in order to create cladings, for example. Dale. And, and a giger expressions like this one. So it's, a, it's, a, it's amazing the expression of the of the of the piece. So then we uh, uh, we replaced the syringe for a digital uh, 3D printing. Oh, it was a ceramic printing we had at our studio that was designed in house. Dale. Um, and uh, the the ceramic one was totally how can I say uh, changed for printing. Uh, 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 this uh, stone paste, this stone paste uh, in a way, basically, it's a giant syringe with uh, uh, with a uh, screw, dale, mm -hmm. and the, the, they are the first uh, things. So uh, these are some experiments in order to create a stool, and we we were we were working on creating a, path, a simple path in order to use the material on the syringe because it's always something technique that you have to develop and this uh, <laughs> this wear part it's made in the kiln and we didn't know that it will happen but we think that it has a kind of very nice expression on this compression part as Beto said at the beginning, the important thing in doing all those processes is that you can um, systematize those uh, mistakes or the, uh, that kind of information and become them in parameters that allows you to design new things. Mm -hmm. And also appear some details like this, that it's, to me, it's really nice how those parts get together. Just the detail. This one was just one path that that was super nice yeah, and allow us uh, to save time in in, in printing uh, and a movement and it was super nice. This one was uh, the the first dysgraphia controlled in the in the volcanic stone, dale, dale, and this one was totally this graph here. <laughs> but also controlled in a way you can see some geometries you can uh, you can find. It, even though it's a simple cylinder, 
but there is a, something that you can find there is a, 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 a kind of uh, order. Dale. And now, and, ah, dale. And this is the, a piece that match these two process, the plastic process and the stone process in one piece. And you can see we are now creating a, a lamp with the base is on rock and the shader is in plastic. And we've been developing this kind of texture. If you can see here, over here, this kind of, kind of I don't know how to say, but the machine is doing a kind of <laughs> plastic. <laughs> and, and the stone is dropping higher from the base. It is printing. So no, this is, we, we, we are very excited on this uh, result right now. And actually, uh, there we also are experimenting uh, about the, um, the feed rate and uh, and the velocity and displacement uh, velocities. Yes, I don't know if the the right word, uh, but are related to have more trans transparency in the material um, and the temperature, for example. So we are combining different uh, parameters in order to have more transparency in this, uh, like Sebastian mentioned it before. <laughs> um, and and, it's, and 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 the piece in itself is nice because we are in a, in a way we are mixing two materials that one is the garbage of the one is the garbage of the humanity, the pit, the pet bottles uh, that we are using for a plastic part, and the other one is the garbage of the mineral world, it is basically the, the the volcanic stone. Dale. Now uh, this new project we are working on a kind of self-organization uh, object that's always mixing programming and, and whatever. <laughs> This was uh, the first test that it's, uh, we are reproducing an, an experiment of uh, Seyoto with the uh, Boronoi pattern. Se formó al tiro. <laughs> oh, yeah. And you can also realize the happening, <laughs> the happy time when some experiment is working. And we reproduced that. Okay, well, I don't know. Ahí. Dale. Okay, so there you can see an ex uh, an experiment uh, that uh, reproduced the the Boronai algorithm in an analog way, but you, always you we, we can find this in nature. But the, the important thing here is that we can reproduce the process, uh, and that is a knowledge we can use for many other projects. For example, that one, uh, as all the grains are in equilibrium, they have the one back, please. Um, and as all the material is in equilibrium, we can put uh, all the piece, uh, this piece very carefully inside the kiln, and we can turn back, uh, we can. Uh, become the, the all the grains in stone again and create a solid panel. For example, this one could be works very very nice for acoustic because it has geometry, the, these concavities, but also have um, uh, density, a, a lot of density. So uh, commonly in the acoustic uh, ceilings. Uh, you have to use two things to uh, to 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 reach that. But with this, we can uh, we can um, how can I say use that in just one material. Uh, next one. So with the with the how can I say with the negative of the of the material that comes through also happen uh, uh, this uh, tessellation, um, but the opposite. So for that we are using we are creating some mirrors that uh, as, uh, uh, can be programmed di digitally, but also they can be created freely in a how in a way that Pollock made some years ago in a in a very free way. So um, it's, it's it is uh, super nice because it can be controlled and also can be free. Um, dale. Here's some results, and here you realize that we are using different uh, techniques we have uh, uh, controlled before that how we can create smooth surfaces uh, and how we can create uh, very bubble surfaces just controlling the temperature variables. Dale. And here we will show you uh, the last project of this presentation. It's called Conscious Actions. 
Uh, this project uh, was a competition we won on uh, created by the Miami Design District, and we the the competition asked to create something that could be related to the energy and the use of that and the problems that you can you can think about energy in the contemporary world. So what we created was a kind of device in a swing that. When you, when you use it, you can see what's the consequence of your actions in your immediately environment. And that's the final message we want to give with this work. And we, <coughs> we design everything in Chile and we create all the detailing, thing, the detailing uh, documents for digital fabrication at which, and it was made in Atlanta. And we made everything by Zoom and WhatsApp, and it was. And we think that we have created some new friends makers around the world. And also, installation was guided by uh, WhatsApp. Yeah, yeah. Ba basically, we live in WhatsApp and Zoom during two months, in a way. So basically, this project uh, uh, invited us to think about uh, how um, the, the impact that our actions has in our environment. That was uh, the, the main idea. So when you swing, uh, you interact with the, with the piece, uh, pulling the ceiling and creating these kind of waves. Um, The video is a bit chuck chuck. And this is the oh, I don't know, sorry, sorry. This is the system using the springs, and um, we use some uh, US catalogs to create everything, and we we put everything in a model with the sure. with the fabricator. Sorry. Yeah, it is nice. In in some points we designed it with the. Uh, how can I say the stone parameters? And here we use as a variable the catalog, the MacMaster catalog. That is a beautiful uh, hardware catalog that American has got created during the years. The years. So here is another way to to create expression of, with the local things we can we can find. Dale. E, that's it. So. <laughs> <laughs> If you want to know more, more about us, okay, you can okay, perfect. Follow, Thank you. you can follow our Instagram. Maybe we have taken a lot of time. We made it faster as possible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, congratulations, uh, guys. Has been an amazing presentation about uh, all the things that you are doing. Uh, um, um, well, uh, so our next, next guest is uh, Tomas Vivanco. Uh, Tomas um, is a Chilean architect, a PhD candidate in architecture and urban planning in Digital Futures Group from Tongji University in Shanghai, and a master in advanced architecture from the Institute of Advanced Architecture of Catalonia. Yeah? Uh, he has co-edited and published how revitalize the cultural heritage throughout innovation and digital fabrication. Fabricating Society and the Counterculture Room books, the last one as part of the Chilean Pavilion at the London Design Biennale in 2016. He hosts the 13th International Fab Lab Conference and Symposium, uh, Fabricating Society in Santiago 2017. His projects and articles have been published and exposed in more than 20 countries. In his work focused on computational design for low energy, uh, material systems and the impact of digital technologies in creative processes and society and digitalization and for processes for developing sustainable ecosystems and communities. Currently, he he's an assistant professor in the Faculty of Architecture and Design and Urban Studies at the Catholic University of Chile, director of FabLab Australia in the same university in Puerto Williams. Uh, he's a faculty, a faculty in the Masters in Design of Emerging Futures in uh, IACC, Elislava, Master in Cities, and Master in Advanced Design in UC. 
And also here is a research in Fab City Foundation and the Cape Horn International Center for Global Change Studies and Biocultural uh, Conservation. So uh, welcome to us uh, to, to, for to, here to the Digital Futures and um, uh, please, uh, <laughs> the scene is all yours. Thank you very much, Alberto. Um, thank you very much for the, the organizers for inviting me. And please let me know if you can see my, my full screen. I can't see the chat, but I suppose that it is, yeah, great. Well, um, even, even that we didn't plan this, probably I will start linking uh, my presentation with, with what the, uh, Guillermo and Sebastian just, just said about the impact of the things that, or the actions that we have in our, in our direct environment. Um, let me find this, okay. So um, I will talk about, uh, about uh, novel entities, about how we can maybe design or approach a novel entity uh, through material intelligence. Um, and and I will divide my presentation in, in three main or four main stages. The first one will be a much a little bit of theoretical and let's say conceptual approach of what I understand as novel entities and also what is um, how, how computational design or robotic, uh, digital fabrication might be a, an approach to understand a new process of designing these new no harmless novel entities. And then I will short uh, very briefly three different kind of categories of projects, one related with machines, another one with material, and the third one with AI. So what is a novel entity? A novel entity uh, or new entities are defined as the artificial elements or the things that we as humans design and create, but also we introduce into the environment. And those things uh, might have a positive or negative disruptive uh, impact in our planetary system. Until a couple of weeks ago, novel entities uh, were mapped in our, or were, were quantified in our environment. So we can, um, our, our society was moving, understanding, let's say the impact of different vectors in our, uh, in our uh, ecological ceiling, but also in our social foundations. Uh, but just only a couple of weeks ago, maybe one, uh, no more than one, maybe, um, an article appeared where they use this methodology of mapping and, and measuring the uh, novel entities impact in our environment. Uh, I mentioned in three main stages, the relevance, the facility, and the cohesiveness of these entities in our whole biosphere ecosystem. Well, the results of this were absolutely catastrophic. The Stockholm Resilience Center updated this planetary boundaries framework and published only one week ago uh, how uh, these five, five boundaries are transgressed, but now included these novel entities. The things that we design and the things that we invent from a creative perspective, the things that the designers does, the things that urbanists and architects does, we, that we do in our daily life, the things that we might find that interest because of we, because of we like it, because of our humanist ego, let's say, are having a catastrophic consequences in our environment, probably conditioning our future. And if we go deeper to analyze country by country, we will understand that, also we will see that any country of all the countries in the world are living outside this social foundation and also the uh, outside the ecological ceiling. This means that we are living on credit. This means that we need more planets or we need to find another planet to continue designing the thing that we like. So somehow we need to readjust uh, or objectives and somehow, but also we need to extreme the use of new technologies in order to redesign and rethink the way how we are producing. So how we can take action, how we can take action through design and also through technology. Mainly from my perspective, we are living uh, after 60 years, more, somehow the same thing that we're living, the cybernetics, right? Um, when Vinet and everyone was talking about the impact of computational, uh, computational science in our society, we are living more or less the same, right? Uh, 
and we are having also the same technical problem. They, they will, all the theory was proving a theoretical perspective, but they didn't have the computation, they didn't have computational power in order to test in the real world uh, these uh, theoretical advances. Now with the metaverse, it's more or less the same somehow, right? With the 5G. Um, regarding Intel, they just published last year, they, they said that we, we need 1,000 more computational power that and actually until now doesn't exist to keep and maintain the metaverse. That means that if we really want to become digital somehow, we need much more computational power. So, and, and to do that, we are all at the same time, we are, um, let's say, uh, harming our natural environment. So one condition of this of the cybernetic principles is its universality. It's available to integrate a range of different issues through a set of organizations that through a generative process might acquire distributed um, uh, distributed design uh, topology, right? Um, and also we can understand machines as interactional objects that suggest that are typically considered to be material systems defined by nature or by their own components. Uh, by the objective that they fulfill somehow. Uh, and as a third um, principle is the idea of how we can program the consciousness machines, how we can program consciousness machines that might have a cybernetic approach. So machines, that the fact that machines are units is super obvious, right? But the fact that they are comp uh, comprised of components, uh, characters that are also characterized by their own properties is that is not so evident. So it's not evident to understand machines through that relationships or the impact of that they can have with their environments. And the fourth and the last uh, pillar that stand my presentation is that the digital cannot exist without the physical support. Uh, the same happened with cybernetic systems, right? Um, and, it, and with materials also that they can become physical, but they can operate only as digital entities. So the first stage is DFAB machines. DFAB means design and fabrication machines at the same time. And how these machines can uh, be interactive and can they prototype only what the environmental conditions can say. In this case, this is an injection 3D printing machine that works in the Atacama Desert in the north of Chile, developed almost six years ago. Uh, and the key things here is that machines have also some sensors and we program all the software to control the machine. So the machine was the, was reading the environmental conditions and depending on the environmental conditions, we can get a specific sample of, a, of an object, right? So it's not just only a, a, technic, a, a technical machine that is fabricating something, it's also understood as a whole system that interacts with the environment. So in that period of time, in between 2016 and 18, I was working with my students, developing some DFAB machines, uh, starting only with trash. What in the conventional, let's say, um, economical system, we can understand something that is, is a trash that you can take from a basket, for instance, we can use it as an energy, or we can use it to understand the energy of that object in order to design um, a machine that can also fabricate something. In this case, students that they continue working with this project after after this um, after this um, academic uh, action, um, they found a machine to cut the grass. They found a small kit camping kitchen, and with the motor of the machine to cut the grass, they start to. Um, um, they, they started the motor and, and they started running and they put some liquid inside and then with the, with the kitchen, they were melting um, some wax. And when they posit the wax over the water, they can generate a specific shape. Another, another project uh, developed by students were machines that can torsion some small filaments of uh, metal. In this case, the metal was reading and, and, and or the machine was interacting with the environment, with the light of the environment of the specific room. And then depending on the amount of light, the machine was torsing these pieces of metal in order to generate a whole facade system. In other cases, another students were working and again with melting some wax, but understanding that the melting of wax was, was associated with the idea of going to the church and when people put the wax on in the front, right? So they were generating some natural patterns in order to 3D print with walks in, a, in an organic way, interacting with its environment. 
The second stage of, of ideas is the material intelligence. And I'm working with the specific the, this idea of design mesoscale that I first heard from, from GFAO in Shanghai a couple of years ago, where we don't work with materials into the scale of where material scientists would work, but also we don't work with materials in the scale of, of or in the long scale of architecture or design. It's just this small scale in between where we where materials become interactive. Um, so we started designing with in, the, in, the, in, the, in this period of time, uh, different biomaterials and how we can and uh, try to give some material performance or, or material properties to the uh, through geometry. And in this case, uh, we earn uh, uh, a research funding to develop uh, some bioplastic samples with, uh, with algae, with carrageenan, uh, and doing some biofilms that we manage to 3D print and also to laser cut in order to test and try the different samples. The idea here is not just to develop a specific bioplastic or biomaterial, but also to extract as much information that we can from the sample in order to make up a, a prototype or a, or, a, or a material that might be useful and that might, com that might be comparative uh, with other uh, petrol-based materials, right? And then the idea is how we can input this new material in order to predict what we can do. Ongoing, we have a research project uh, from Catholic University and such with some material scientists and also a computational scientist. Uh, we're developing a, a pilot project in the Region de los Lagos where we are taking the local biomass specifically from algae. And also we train a machine learning uh, model to classify and to predict, to, to, to classify more than 1,700 bioplastic recipes, academic articles. So we can classify them and we can get and extract their own recipes. So understanding of, of so the idea here is to read the potential biomass uh, um, availability of a specific um, of a specific region in Chile, and also to predict what are the kind of materials that we can get from that. So in a second stage of continuing working uh, with these material ideas is to the idea of how we can maximize a material system, um, a three-dimensional performance by designing only that material in two dimensions with the minimum use of energy. So here we, we, do a, we did a prototype um, starting from a basic aesthetic structure geometry of 10 by 10 cells. Each cell was about one to one unit. Uh, and then depending on the distance of, of, the, of each cell center, uh, with, a, with a, a force, a, a point force, we can, uh, uh, um, we, 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 um, we can simulate the material deformation using a particle spring system. So when we have the deformation, we can extract some specific features, right? So after the PS simulator, uh, we can extract, let's say, the escalating points, the Gaussian curvature, the global deformation of this mesh that we were generating. In, and from that, we created a generative uh, data set of more than 2,000 uh, different uh, uh, data per each one of the six features. So from that digital prototypes, uh, we train a regression model and we understood which are the correlation principles in between all the, all the material variables in order to understand and to remake the geometry in an adaptive way. This means that if we can predict, if we can uh, predict one specific feature of the material, if we can, also the idea of predict, by predicting one specific um, feature of the material, the idea is to rebuild the whole mesh without passing one on one hand from the particle spring system simulator, but also reducing considerably the amount of time, but also reducing the embedded energy in order to produce these um, geometries. So the results were actually very accurate. We achieved using only AI or machine learning models um, uh, a precision of 98%. So by reducing, for instance, two or three days of generating a data set or, or let's say testing and uh, uh, physical prototypes also, uh, we can reduce that in just a, just a few seconds by all, only using computational technologies. In the same line, we started working, uh, we worked uh, in, um, in 4D printing. This means that using again, or, or pre, 3D printing a very small and thin uh, pattern over a pre-stretched pre uh, 
te textile, we can, depending on the type of pattern, we can understand the behavior of that pattern. And then once we release the stress, we can generate a 3D, form a, a 3D deformation. So again, with the minimum mater external material and with the minimal external energy, we can maximize the three dimensional performance. And for that, of course, we have to do a lot of uh, material research, physical research and mechanical constraints research. And here you can see the uh, one very simple example, right? In order to design this cap, the one that you can see that have the much more three dimensional performance, let's say, have much less material than the one in the left hand. So that means that only by designing the pattern in 2D, we can maximize this form. And again, the next step is to start working now with concrete and to do some flexible uh, form works with textiles, uh, uh, work that we already started developing in some studio classes in Catholic University. And then the third and last uh, is the artificial intelligence. And I would only put this case because it's a specific case of Chile. Um, a client once asked me to design his house a couple of years ago, and he came up with a portfolio or like let's say a Pinterest board with many ideas of Chilean houses of houses built in Chile in the past year. And more or less they all were looking the same. So I called some friends for Mike Daly and asked them, I asked them if they can give me their database of the best architecture, uh, Chilean architecture houses nominated by the state the, uh, the Daly's community. So I, have, I got access to houses built in Chile in the past 10 years. Here you can see some examples. And I, and, and, and I start uh, creating this huge data set of images and I train and style GAN model, right? In order to understand which, what is novelty, what does it mean to design in a specific culture and how we can explore this limit of creativity using AI. Um, uh, here. So after training the first uh, set of, uh, of houses here, or, so, or, or, or the first set of data set here, you can see the first results, right? Some houses totally designed, design I means in quotes, because it is only two dimensional graphics. This is not a house, this is not a, this is not a, a, a voxel, um, but this is the image looks like the image of the house. This house doesn't, ex does, doesn't exist, but this house are representative, are representative of the data set that we have. So the idea of novelty, of the idea of new, of the idea of, let's say, author design is truly questioned uh, with uh, new technologies. And here you can see some of the uh, Latin vectors, some images of the Latin vector space. And also what we did with uh, these houses in order to prove again the, the model is that we train a model in order to detect objects, an AI-based model. So we train the model in order to say if what they're looking of what is looking again with the synthetic images, it might become a house or may, might become a void. So computational design and digital fabrication offers a clear path to reduce the energy and environmental impact of novel entities, but also uh, is uh, pursue us to change this conventional object-oriented design process to a systemic oriented uh, design uh, logic. And that is my, I think, 17 minutes uh, by now. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much for your amazing and quite inspiring presentation, uh, indeed. Well, uh, our next, uh, next guest is uh, Diego Pinochet from M MIT. Uh, Diego Pinochet works focus on bridging design and making as a continuous process by using digital tools and cognitive de devices instead of, of pure representational or productive tools. His research is focused on advanced computational design and interactive fabrication methodologies using artificial intelligence. He's pursuing his PhD degree in design and computation at MIT with a major in uh, human computer interaction and a minor in machine learning. He seeks to bridge robotic fabrication with design methodologies to push innovation in design, architecture, and construction throughout uh, his research. Diego Pinochet is a PhD researcher at the Design and Computation Group at MIT, researched at the Encoded Elements Lab in the International Design Center at MIT as well, and a visiting PhD student at the Human Computer Interaction Group at MIT, CSAIL and a professor at the School of Design at UAI uh, in Chile. Uh, Diego Pinochet holds a bark and a mark in the Pontificia Catholic University of Chile and a Master of Science in Architectural Studies in, uh, from uh, MIT as well. So welcome, uh, Diego. 
to this uh, morning, afternoon, or evening, <laughs> according to our location in the globe, um, uh, the scene is yours. Okay, let me reshare because for some reason, uh, I don't know why I'm using Google Slides. Okay, now you see the full screen of the presentation? Yes, yes, yes. perfect, perfect. Okay, good. I will get rid of my notes. Yeah, uh, Google Slides is probably not the best platform to present with Zoom. So anyway, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I will keep it short. Uh, my presentation is called uh, From Making Gestures to Making uh, Mistakes, a Body-Centric Approach to Computational Design. So what I will show today is mostly the work that I had, um, mostly related to academia, uh, of my teaching experience in uh, for more than uh, 12 years now, uh, but especially or specifically the past experiences at Adolfo Ibanez University, the design lab at Adolfo Ibanez University, and uh, recently at MIT, um, testing one specific uh, computational design um, methodology. So I will keep like most of the work that I produce on the side that has to do with robotics or, or even like AI that is part of my PhD research um, out, out of this presentation, just to keep it short. So um, what you see here is something that I always show to my students. And this is a quote from Pascal uh, that it talks about the difference between the mathematical mind and the perceptive mind. And I really like the last part when it says mathematicians, in this case, we can say like technicians, right? Wish to treat matters of perception, uh, perception mathematically and make themselves ridiculous. The mind does it tacitly, naturally, and without technical rules. And this kind of resonates with the previous presentations from, from, from Willy, uh, Sebastian, and, and, and Tomas. Um, because as, as, as designers, right, as, as architects, and also because we're related with technology, uh, we get the feeling that, is, that there is something else. Uh, beyond the use of like one specific technology. So this is a question that I always ask to my students in terms of, uh, I ask them, what is computational design first? Or what do you think computational design is? But more specifically, it's like, what is computation, right? And this has to do with not the what, in terms of what technology will you use or how will you use technology, but it has to do with also the so what. And the first thing that I, 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 I tell them is that um, computation is not the same as digital computation. And this is something that I always um, ask on the first day of classes, like mostly on all my classes, uh, as a way to keep a good balance between expectations and reality. And that has to do a little bit with um, asking them and showing, showing them uh, things like this, like, is this computation? right? What we, we see in terms of like using digital tools to simulate, optimize, and so on and so forth, or is this computation, right? Uh, in this case, what you're seeing here is um, the first implementation or basically the, the seminal paper on shape grammars that basically talk about computation as a way of calculating. And if we look for the definition of what computation is, what does it mean to compute? It has to be with the idea of calculating something, right? So we are computers. The only difference is that we're not digital computers. So as you can see, we can, we can uh, uh, when we come to this idea of, of computation, it has to do with this idea of, of, of basically performing operations and understanding operations as we, as we go. And this starts from, again, from this idea that Mostly when we talk or, or, or when we introduce, for example, the students about this idea of computational design, they think that this is something um, very related to what you see in this, in this image that you will basically have at your disposal, some sort of like modern oracle where you can extract meaning or even knowledge, right? That resides over there. And this is very similar to, for example, like a, um, what um, uh, um, the difference that was talked during like the, the late eighties or early nineties about this, the differences between the, the STS community versus the computer science community, this idea of 
extracting the knowledge but uh, versus the idea of just like creating the knowledge right so because usually it's it's a little bit like this when we talk about and even for for people that are designers but that are not in the computational world they see or they believe that this is something like this what do we do if i consider myself a computational designer right it's about like sprinkling a little bit of parametric design in the past, right? Then years later, it's just like sprinkle a little bit of agent and cellular automata, or let's sprinkle some biomaterials or let's sprinkle some robots. Now, everything is about robots, right? Robots and stuff like that. Or let's sprinkle some machine learning, but we call it AI, to make things more interesting. And this is something that actually students believe at some point if they don't know anything about this, that this is what's happening. And this will continue. This has been like, I don't know, going for a couple of decades now that there's always some trend that basically computational design um, graphs and apply to design to make it maybe like more interesting. But um, in my case, I address these issues and I discuss them with my, with my students. We, we, we engage in a conversation because one of the reasons also for, for coming um, here to MIT, that this is the only place that I really wanted to come to to actually continue my my, my graduate studies, um, is uh, the vision of, of what is computation that that my group has, the design and computation. And there is a really good post from Onur, Onur Jujegun, a good friend of mine on Medium. You should read it because it explains very well what I'm talking about when it comes to the idea of using computation or computational design. And Basically says that he, he, he puts the description of, my, of, of, of the computation, uh, computation group at MIT about what computational design is, is the way in which design meaning, intentions, and knowledge are constructed through computational thinking, representing, sensing, and making. So basically, it, it talks about something a little bit more complex than just using Sorry, digital tools. Uh, but at the same time, um, it talks about, about that it's a, it's a more um, integrated process, not only, uh, for example, with the tools that we have, but also the materials and also, so basically it talks about this idea of, of a more like aesthetic experience type of, of process. So in my case, I started asking these questions a while ago, right? And this is probably the only image that I will show of this project that has been like shown too many times. Uh, that this is part of my master's thesis at MIT with this idea of uh, engaging in an interactive fabrication process because I, uh, uh, among all the things that I do, I'm very interested in, in this idea of creativity and this idea of, of the debate that happened during the, the early 60s and 70s about this idea of automate, like uh, augmentation of design from versus the automation of design, right? So I was asking myself, can this be computation? Like in a way, what you see in this image is a way of interacting as a, as a human with a machine to actually operate on in the world, right? And this is why I developed a, uh, a couple of years ago, probably like uh, five years ago, uh, a methodology that was, um, that started, um, or basically that took this idea of computational making a, a term that was coined by Terry Knight and George Steiny. Terry Knight is my advisor for my PhD, and also she was my advisor for, for the master's at, at MIT, um, about this idea of designing with discrete things made of unpredictable stuff, right? We're always dealing with ambiguity, not only in our heads, uh, our heads like quoting, right? But also we're dealing with ambiguity on the, uh, within the design context where things are happening. And again, again, I think it's, it's very good that I came like after those previous presentations because that component was there as well, right? This idea of like errors, for example, or mistakes or things that are unpredictable when you're designing with, with, with materials and also with technology. So what you see here, this is a framework that I apply with my students with the idea of like how, for example, an object, a thing that is being designed responds to like some sort of like indexicality instead of like iconicity, right? Is how do you understand your designs as the object of being made versus the object to be made? And that has to do also with the idea of representation or producing an icon to then, um, that is rationalized to then um, enacting it. And this relates to also something that I, I've shown like many times, this idea of like designing or making is very similar to cooking, 
right? Where you follow certain procedure, but that procedure is not fixed because there are always some components that you need to adjust, right? The amount of salt or the until, or be aware until the water is absorbed, or for example, like bring to a boil. Those are like very ambiguous and in, in design, when you're making things, they happen as well. So what I do in this methodology with my students, I start teaching them rules, rule-based design, basically a way of calculating, a, a way of computing with shapes, but also not only computing with shapes, but computing with, with materials, right? And in that sense, I always like to, or, or I'm, uh, I, I started with this idea of like pushing this, this idea of, of computation, but operating in the, in the, in, with materials basically like leaving be, uh, behind this idea of like this hylomorphic process of representing and then operating on material. How can you just like compute with things, with your hands, with your gestures, with your computers in an interactive way to produce new things? So I got like some results with my students teaching them about or introducing them uh, the idea of design, that design could be like uh, operated in this way, not only to produce objects, but also to produce like new methodologies and new knowledge as you go. And you see that here are some examples, for example, with students working with this idea of, of, of rules and calculation, but also adding, uh, for example, like robotic arms to interact with them to, to build uh, structures. In this case, these are just provocations. But the interesting part is like how this methodology was pushing this idea of, of establishing what are the design ingredients, right? What are the ingredients of or within a design context in terms of, again, like the materials? Can you map the materials that you're going to use? Can you map also like some sort of recipe? And in that way, you can also establish, for example, like some operations. And those operations will be manifested in different ways if you, for example, give this to your friends or to like not or to your partner to actually enact those recipes. And that was very interesting because uh, through this process, a lot of like mistakes or let's say like infidelities or, or, or things that were not supposed to be that way started to happen. So that gave origin to new recipes, to new objects, to new products and to new know-how about to do things. Here are some results from students. Now, this is, a, this is the work of, of Lucas Helle that he's working with, uh, with uh, Willie and Sebastian, one of my best students ever. Um, where basically you can, uh, I don't know, like how can you work with materials to create processes to, to mix, for example, like stone and metal using like a robotic arm process. Um, so the main idea behind this, and this was tested again, like years ago, is it start, started from this quote from, from, from my advisor, Terry Knight, where she stated that making is a kind of design. But in my case, I'm a little bit more radical. And I said like, Making is designing and designing is making because to me, there is no a, um, uh, a difference between, between both. Uh, in my idea uh, for design to be, to exist, there needs to be something that goes outside the, the realm of, of ideas of your head because um, I have a strong opinion about how design processes are constrained by this trichotomy between idea, representation, and execution. And this is something that we inherited since like the invention of architectural design. I know that Neil Leach won't like this because I always quote uh, Alberti and, and all that thing. So these are like material manifestations or provocations that emerge from the inaction of those, of those things. And I will go a little bit faster so I can take more time. So then I started to think, okay, if we really want to have like this idea of like interaction or basically create this idea of design context where we apply design intelligence and that intelligence, and again, this relates to, for example, the ideas of, of uh, Maturana and Varela about this idea of like agents, autopoietic agents interacting within a context, right? To produce new intelligence or to produce new knowledge is that, okay, can we use that intelligence, for example, to create a behavior from our tools. So this is why, for example, what you see on the screen is one of the, like a very old paper that I did with a colleague here at MIT, is like, how can you basically avoid or representation or reformulate representation in order to create something? So this is like an AI model uh, that was trained with 
uh, three-dimensional generative adversarial networks where basically with minimum user input in the form of just like an image, uh, can you basically interact with the computer to co-create something that is in 3D, that is a watertight mesh that you can 3D print, for example. Or my experiments in terms of like making computers understand their environment and uh, working with deep perception to understand, for example, not only when where objects are, but what, what are the objects that you are detecting as a computer. These are all like provocations that are part of, of, of my research. What you see here is exactly that. Not only detect an object in space, but also detect, for example, like the shape of an object. So you can uh, um, train a robot to grab it, uh, interact in a, with, with the robot to, to enable collaboration. In this case, for example, what you see is uh, using again, like deep perception to not only control, but for example, like to generate routines and perform with the robot at the same time. Uh, or during the pandemic, this is one of my projects. I grabbed an uh, open source platform for a robot and modified it and, and, and made it work because I didn't have access to, to a robot. So these are all things that have been populating my, my, my work that somehow I wanted to apply uh, or, or keep applying to expand this methodological, uh, methodological framework in, in academia. What you see here, for example, are some explorations So how can you basically train a robot to teach another robot to perform? And those things were tested, for example, uh, with um, uh, medium scale uh, ceramics printing. So these are the things that I do that at the same time are um, put like to the test, for example, in, in in my academic practice. So what you see here is, is some, it's, it's a studio, and this is the last part of my presentation, that is called Making Ingredients. It's, uh, and a lot of people ask me like, uh, why is it called uh, Making Ingredients? This is something that I taught with Lavender Tesmer, also a PhD student here, uh, an amazing colleague. She works with Skylar Tibbetts at the self assembly Lab. Also with Joseph Choma and Maya Hayuk, they were both guest lecturers. Joseph Choma is like probably known uh, by everybody with the fiberglass uh, folding patterns. And Maya Hayuk is one of the most amazing street artists that she lives in New York. You should ch check her out, check her work. So uh, the idea of making ingredients and, and what I was um, answering to people that why the name is was not that we, will, we were going to actually make new ingredients, but it, it was like working with the ingredients of a making process. So we asked this to our students, what is the context of making? Can you basically start a design by defining this idea of context? Uh, and by context, like the availability of machines, for example, on campus, the availability of, of material, how will you source materials? How will you basically work with what you have at hand? And um, uh, the context in terms of like the authorizations, for example, to install something at MIT because the studio, Basically, the only request by the Department of Architecture is that the students, they want to make things after the pandemic. How will you basically um, teach a studio that has a final, as a final goal, has the, the idea of like making installations, like architectural provocations or material provocations at the scale of architecture. So we made a map like every possible constraint from fabrication materials, authorizations, or people that you need to talk, for example, to, to, to get permission to, to install something at MIT. And there was a very nice process because in this sense, it was a good way to test that uh, you can design and make computationally uh, beyond this trichotomy uh, imposed by the limits of ideas, representations, and executions as separate process. And how can you basically make new recipes or ways of making that you can share, you can reformulate, you can give to your, to, to your I don't know, the person who's sitting next to you to actually create new knowledge. And, uh, and through this process of iteration and testing with materials and using computers as well at the same time and using your tools and so on and so forth, but I, um, you can get amazing results. So what I'm showing you here are just like some of the results, like of different uh, projects. For example, this, this was an amazing uh, work of one of the students that he said like, okay, we have one limitation or one constraint to actually make. And it's like, um, we're in a, we, are, we are in an architecture school. So 
uh, he collected paper. So he created like all this design context idea around the paper that is produced and discarded, for example, in an architecture school. And that was amazing because he collected paper for one semester and he made this life cycle of not only a, a, a material, but basically like of architecture that after you produce it, you can, uh, af after you build something with that uh, material and you basically design it with tools, with machines and stuff like that, uh, it can go back, for example, to the recycled stream. It was a beautiful project or exp explorations with, with fabrics, with foam, with uh, other type of materials uh, to produce amazing structures, for example, like this one. It was a very like big and weird structure produced with, with, uh, by one of uh, our students. Or for example, uh, the computation, the, the design context, for example, to apply computation, um, in, in, in this case, this was a project from one of our students talking about this idea of like, what is the, the kitchen, right? Where things happen. So he mounted in one of the corners of MIT, a, a full uh, factory or kitchen uh, to make his project a reality. He was working with, with, um, with a specific materials to create this, this uh, type of shading and, and, and color. And the results were like also like really great. Or another student, this is the last one that I will show, to work with, for example, like recycled wood, reclaimed wood from pallets. How can you work with this to actually create like beautiful objects using computation? Um, or using this idea that I just exposed uh, before. And he created this amazing, uh, uh, basically, again, like I, I like to call this like provocations uh, that you can um, create with like something that has basically like no value. And he, he, he gave a, a new value to it. And this was very important because I think this was like a, a very good, uh, test and, and, and the way of proving like some of the context that I, I talked before, that um, how can you create a methodology to make them understand that um, there is something beyond just like the typical computation where you can apply basically whatever you want, but it's not about that. And I like to link with what, for example, uh, Guillermo was saying about the, the, the generic outcomes that comes from using technology today that has a lot of, that comes from a lot of the hype of using like the new, the next new thing that, that, that basically emerges like AI or grasshopper, or maybe in 15 years, we won't know what grasshopper is and there will be something else. Uh, but how can basically use that to your favor, right? Uh, so it doesn't feel that using computational design in the, in the, in the way that most of the people understand it uh, leaves you with that sensation when you basically eat at the, the cafeteria of your of your school, that no matter what you eat at the end of the of, of the of the week, basically it leaves you the same flavor because everything tastes the same. So um, I don't know. I just wanted to show you this and and, and a different approach or basically like a different uh, outcome of uh, uh, of the things that I normally do that has to do with my academic practice. Thank you very much. Here's my website email or even like Instagram if you want to reach out and to know more about the things that I do. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Diego, for your outstanding <laughs> production <laughs> with the, from your research and as well with the work that you are uh, running with your students and, and everything has been super enriching. Thank you very much for sharing with us all this refreshing vision about what is a digital design and what is, what is computation for sure. <laughs> well, uh, our next, next guest in the panel and the, the last one uh, is Complex Geometries uh, with uh, Angelica Videla and Gonzalo Muñoz. Well, Angelica Videla is senior architect at Sahadit Architects. Uh, as well, academic and the Faculty of Architecture and Urbanism at the University of Chile, where she directs the design studio Six Technological and Digital Integration. He, her ongoing research is focused on computational design, which has a specific interest in the structural geometries that are optimized for digital fabrication through the printing and robotic fabrication. Mm -hmm. Gonzalo Muñoz, on the other hand, uh, he's a, a teaching assistant of the Studio of Technological and Digital Integration and a Specialization of Course of Advanced Digital Design at the University of Chile. 
His research uh, is focused on the self-structural geometries based on comp computer design processes. As well, he uh, just uh, is, uh, was selected as uh, one of the new curators in the Chilean Biennale <laughs> in this year. So welcome, guys. Uh, uh, a real pleasure to, to, to be with you here. Um, the scene is yours. Thank you very much, Alberto. Can you hear us properly? Yes. Yeah? Okay, great. Can you see the screen as well? Yes. Great. Perfect. Just one sec. Move that here. Great. So, hello all. Thank you very much uh, for having us today. With my colleague Gonzalo, we are going to address the questions of digital design and computational thinking um, from a teaching point of view. I will start by presenting the design studio we have been running for the past few years to explain our specific approach. Then we will present two of the projects that um, were developed this last semester to illustrate how students can apply our methodology to develop thoughtful speculative proposals. And finally, I would like to briefly introduce a few ideas as to how computational thinking and digital design could be useful in future efforts to face some of Thiele's strategic issues and challenges, as well as some of the next steps and new digital technologies we are looking to integrate in our design studio. Um, I will not present us uh, again because uh, Alberto has already done that. Um, but here are two images of, of our special, specialization course of advanced digital design in complex geometries and the Design Studio 6 uh, at the University of Chile. Here are, are a few examples of the work we have been doing with our students in the past two years at the university. We have really been focusing on using Maya to design architectural projects, pavilions, towers, podiums, and so on with complex geometries and a fluid continuous design. Our general ambition is to teach the students modeling techniques that I use on a daily basis as a designer in the architectural practice, as well as computational thinking to bridge the gap between professional and academic worlds. To give you a little context, we inc the increasing advancement of new digital technologies and manufacturing methods have significant, significantly changed the way in which architectural space is designed and created. The tools and skills that architects use influence design results and inevitably set limits to the architecture we create. Our design studio has been focusing on the application of advanced computational design modeling and generative design methodologies to speculate on the future of architecture and urban design. More specifically, specifically in this course um, takes place at the intersection of design and computation, exploring the topics of housing densification, industrialized and prefabrication, and construction. The objective of this course has been to develop students the interest, knowledge, and critical thinking about contemporary architectural design, including the, rela the relationship between contemporary architectural projects and their urban environment. The course proposes the, to investigate new technologies, sustainable architectural solutions, social changes, and explore radical urban strategies with the user as the central driven as a starting point for the project. We'll start by analyzing how we live today, how we lived in the past in order to speculate how we will be living in, in the next 10, 20, or 100 years. We then try to determine what are key elements that define the way of living and what will be needed in terms of spaces and program. And then we try out ideas to see how this could start taking form. Maya is the main software we used with our student in the studio. 
Maya is a widely used polygon modeling software using many design and architectural practices to achieve high-end design results. In Maya, most of the 3D um, model begins with polygon primitive as a starting point. The technique, the technique is called procedural polygon modeling. In our design studio, focus on how to use these most common Maya transformation tools and how to design with a procedural polygon modeling methodology through a process that breaks down a complicated task into discrete modeling operations. We also looked into how to model with high poly meshes through the exploration of super shapes. Due to the mat mathematical nature of these shapes, we are able to quickly generate complex organic geometries. Super ellipses, spherical harmonics, and ultra shapes are the starting point of our architectural geometry exploration. We looked into the importance of topology and the advantages of low poly procedural modeling with Maya and explored how procedural modeling increases the output of iterative design through reproducible stages in transformation. Ex students explore their own geometrical sequence and create their own set of rules in that sequence for the final design. The geometrical sequence is one of the key parts of the design process. Now we will, we will just like to present two of the projects that we were developing this last semester to illustrate the students, uh, how the student can apply our methodology to develop thoughtful speculative proposals. Um, These both projects uh, were designed over our second semester of 2021, and they are great examples of how digital processes in this teaching experience can be grown in the area of design, and they can overtake sometimes different areas of the construction or processes that mainly are used uh, to think um, after the construction or after the process of finish an art architecture project. Um, they are both, um, well, they were made by uh, Jose Nahuelwen, Daniel Rojas, Catalina Sacan, and Joaquin Tejos, uh, Proyecto Colmena, which is a sustainable island. Uh, and in the right side is the Olympus Odyssey, uh, designed by Daniel Alvarez, Tagia Carmona, Janis Lopez, Josefa Marti, and Joyce Quesada. Can you uh, go to the next one, please? Thank you. So first, we are going to talk about a little bit about uh, Colmena. Uh, Colmena is a project that aims for a self-sustainability city, and it starts with natural references. Uh, it has a lot about fluidity. It has a lot about how poly and low poly modeling with Maya. And <clears throat> even though that it has uh, all these complex geometric references, this project is a great example of a process of designing that includes the rendering and the visualization in the entire process, which more which made it um, a different part of the design that normally is not used uh, when you're working in this level of the academic work. So the facility that gives us to include Blender into this kind of teaching there is not just a discussion about design, it's also a discussion about how is it to be inside the place. And it started to give us information about the lighting, about designing these spaces entirely uh, <laughs> to the most tiny uh, detail. So it gives it a, a different area of design that normally was not being taking place in these academic exercises. And the next case study, uh, which was named, um, oh, sorry, uh, one of the results of the, um, sorry, can you, one of the results that, that you can get from this uh, four pictures maybe is uh, a little bit about that, like that the main design is not necessarily a result of a big uh, exercise of uh, complexity in the design, it's more uh, a simplified, uh, design process that it has to be inside of the building, which extends a little bit more the vision of the architect and allows them uh, with Blender and with the possibility of communicating ourselves 
uh, both teachers and students inside the computer uh, to talk about design in a way more deep uh, processes. Now we can take to another one. In the other case, uh, we have <clears throat> Olympus Odyssey, which has a complete different approach to the design in the same semester, in the same course. Uh, this group uh, aimed to design outside of the of our planet and go to Mars to design a colony. So the discussion was not longer about how do you design this complex form or how do you uh, are going to design something great necessarily. It's more about not only the what, it's also about how are you going to build it. And that stage of design, uh, even though it can't sound something that you have to do it as an architect, when you're thinking about 3D printing and you're thinking about this kind of project, uh, it has started to become more important, maybe the when than the what. So the whole design was thought about how it's going to grow in, from the stage one and to 21, 21 year uh, and 2000, <clears throat> like 100 years after the, the day that we were started design and how it was going to develop with our 3D printing technology in order to grow into build a, a city over there. Um, and you can, you can see in the next slide that the exercise was, of course, including uh, how they, the students are going to 3D print and how this design should uh, make an answer, an answer to, to this problem when you are there. Like how are you going to build it and when are you going to build it in order to grow in a sustainable way. Chile today faces several strategic issues and challenges. High levels of inequalities, limited access to education and healthcare, as well as the negative impact of climate change, raising sea levels, higher temperatures, and less, uh, less precipitation in already dry areas are some of the issues we will need to tackle. I believe that the use of new digital technologies, adaptive design processes, and pushing students toward a thoughtful, speculative user-centered approach has helped us to open the conversation with the students on how to respond to these challenges in the future. The use of digital technologies in the context of our design studio has also shown itself particularly invaluable and it's allowed to make the most with often limited resources. As students no longer have to spend large sum of money on materials for, for large, large scale models or printing, the recent digitalization of education with the multiplication of online workshops, courses, and talks has also given access to teacher courses and new ideas from all around the world. Regarding the next step of our design studio, we are also looking into the possibilities of integrating VR as both a communication and hand-on design tool. We are particularly interested in the place this new tool can take within the design process and how it can allow for new experimental and collaborative workflow. Thank you very much for listening. Well, Thank you very much, guys, for your outstanding uh, production <laughs> with your students and school at the University of Chile. And uh, well, please, uh, let, well, now it's time for our, our nice conversation. Let's share our uh, point of view. And for sure, we have a few questions, I think. I'm, I'm sure Giovanna is, is, a, is, is, is a picking some questions from the audience or maybe from other sources. I'm not sure if you have some few there as well. Camila and Carlos, for sure, you can you can ask as well. And Neil is, is here as well. And what well, Gustavo, yeah. Uh, well, uh, mm -hmm. I have a, a question. Uh, well, it's a question, a comment, and I would like to, that, that the presenters can respond because uh, when we are creating, we have different process. And obviously you are uh, experimented with different uh, methodologies. Um, 
I would like to know uh, maybe a moment of stressful or excited about one of the process, or maybe if you start with a research or you start with an idea and you are uh, surfing in, in this idea. Thanks. Who wants to pick it? <laughs> um. For one day one, <laughs> maybe and. Angelica, who finish? Uh, sure, no yeah, problem. Maybe. So for us, um, we have di different starting points in in the process. We don't have only one, right? Like we have many variables that we want to include in our pro in in our um, product process and not only the process, but as well as the production and different ways uh, as well of doing it. So using different tools, um, different kind of geometries, um, it will allow you to different things and the way that you will think about the things. Um, in our case, um, we use very specific tools. Um, so that's why we're developing kind of like a, like a language, let's say in our geometries, right? Uh, but if you want me to tell you like one starting point, I don't think that we have one because um, for us, the user is the most important person in the whole process. So he will live in the space, right? He will be inside of these spaces. So for us, it's very important to take into account um, the way that we live, the way that we will live in the future because all these projects, they are um, speculative projects for, hundred years, right? So um, yeah, it's not one way of starting the, the, or one thing that it will start the process, but rather like a, a more holistic way of the context of the user of how we are thinking and what we can bring to that conversation as well. Like what could be interesting to push maybe some materials that they are uh, look that you can find locally, what uh, Diego was saying before, right? Like to try to start to study the context and to understand with what you could work in that specific place. What is important for people in that place and how do you think that you can improve that in some way? Perfect. Mm. Well, uh, thank you, Angelica. Um, I have a question. Uh, uh, right, uh, and a, a question for maybe is, is, is for, for uh, great things to people, uh, for Sebastian and Guillermo. I'm starting with, with both. And related with the, this hybrid way of paracrafting, <laughs> because paracrafting uh, uh, is something really interesting in terms of a, a concept that you, you started to develop in your studio. And I want to understand that the paracrafting is a, Maybe it's, a, it's an idea that is still uh, ongoing, is still evolving in, during, uh, during the, your, your, your profession, during every year or every, each project is, a, is, a, is pushing this idea a little bit further in, 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 the, in the context of design. So uh, thinking on that, uh, paracrafting is something that it, it, for you is, is, a, is a way of thinking, or at the same time, it's a way of making, or it, it, or it's, it's, it's related with both things as well. I'm not sure if Guillermo and Sebastian can develop this idea. Yeah, I would say that it's a result more than a more than a, a goal or something like that. Um, I would like also to continue in under the idea of uh, the question of Joanna related of the designing processes. So. Uh, as here at the studio are many guys, uh, we are sometimes six, seven, till 17 in, in some points of our career. <laughs> there are many ideas running in parallel, we can say. Um, some ideas come from uh, materials, some uh, ideas come from uh, desires, obsessions, uh, some ideas come from the clients, uh, from a specific requirement. So uh, in that sense, um, our response to, no, no response, 
our way to make or our way to think in 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 in, in the terms that Alberto is asking um, are uh, how can I say a coined or or are we can say that are try um, <laughs> let, let let me sort my ideas. We can say that all the things we made, we try to make it in a parametrical thinking. Not, not, not try, it's because it's our training in, and, and because it's our way to, to see the things. Uh, we, try to, we try to divide the, the problems or the ideas in, in, in variables. It's our way, it's, it's our way of thinking. But when you um, uh, face this knowledge or those ways uh, of making, with with the things you want to do or you want to resolve for a client or many other things you have to face that with the physical worlds and you have to face that and you have to prove your ideas with uh, physical models or experiments or many other things so that is why we we love to coin this uh, this idea of parametrical thinking with uh, the making of the things independently of the technology of your using. Don't know if I, I, I how can I say, um, it's complete your question, but Sebastian perhaps ha have different uh, ideas of, of the same question. <laughs> we don't need to think the same thing to be together. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but for our crafting, it's a kind of, uh, we realize that the, we love when things are moving or are expressing some nature. It's a kind of, no, it's not an obsession. It's a preference, I can say. When we love, when we see a kind of a louver bonding or whatever, we really love that. I guess that maybe the object can have a kind of life inside of them. And uh, maybe that's another way to think about the same idea. But uh, taking the ideas of Guillermo about how we work, I have this at my hand. So <laughs> we are working on a new idea and I, I started to think, how can I make something with just one piece? And that's a simple question. And then we just start <laughs> putting one together and whatever. Then, then we go back to the computer, but there's no problem. You have to start wherever you want. If you have the quest, you have to make it with one piece, you start just with that. There's, there's no other things. Actually, there is no big ideas. The, 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 the projects uh, behind that, one project has many ideas that are across it. So we, we believe actually the history of the project can be entered at the end in order to, uh, how can I say, to, uh, to communicate in a better way that our, uh, our project. But it's, it's uh, something that is growing. So we can say that paragraphing is not a goal, it's something that is uh, evolving during our, our uh, period of time uh, of working. Oh, well, thank you. It was really interesting. Well, let's start to develop this way, but, uh, these ideas with our other, our, our, our other guests. Well, Gonzalo has a, a question, so I'm not sure, Gonzalo, if you want to, want yeah, to tell, thank uh, you. tell it here. And, and mm -hmm. just one, one thing. Actually, we were talking with mm -hmm. Diego through, 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 um, through Instagram, and I love the idea that Diego mm -hmm. is, is uh, taking all this way to make uh, and he's writing and uh, teaching to her to his students. So I, I love that uh, this way to make is uh, uh, reaching an academic. Uh, uh, how can I say um, in an academic way? So it, it's very important because this way of making traditionally uh, is not uh, well received in academics uh, in in academic context. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I can add yes. one thing uh, on that is that um, when I talk about like the, the first part of the presentation, like why I like to define exactly like co what computational design is, because I never had that like the, the you know, like the, well, I, I had it a little bit when, when I started in um, teaching uh, around like, yeah, 2008 in a, in a Catholic university where like all of this like technology oriented 
uh, methodologies were seen as just like playing. So this is why I, I, I show that uh, slide with the meme of like a sprinkle. It was like yeah. a sprinkle something mm -hmm. on top of <laughs> on top of like architecture, <laughs> the traditional architecture. Um, and at the same time, uh, it, it, the, there is this component of 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 um, again like expectations from the students, right? They don't know what to expect, but the one thing that they do expect is that they will learn grasshopper in your studio and i tell them that always like it's 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 not it's not that and there are ways to basically <laughs> like identify what are the ingredients of the design process that can lead you for example to formulate new questions from things that are already there and i don't know if this answer also like a little bit of the original question but it, it, the design process starts first by basically knowing what what are your what are the things that you're going to basically use to do the, the juggling and then start like thinking or reformulating or twisting um, um, your, your not problems, but basically your questions and come up with maybe like 10 more questions. And also that is like super valid as a design process as well. Even if you don't reach to like a, like in a specific goal. Yes, and we can audio. move. Okay. We can yeah. move with, with that uh, to continue with some questions that we are receiving in, in YouTube. And moving for like to say yeah. the, the border about expectation versus reality in architecture. And the first question is from Italo Vias and with a comment. Congratulations, guys, for yes. the presentation. Yeah. It's super interesting to see how the use of digital tool can be implemented in several scales, context, functions, and even times. And the question, what's the question? Ah, the question is, how do you see your roles as architects, researchers, and scholars moving forward in our current global stage of development? Um, maybe Tomas or can take it, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, didn't go too much the question, but um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but no, um, I, I was thinking about what what Diego and Guillermo was were mentioning before this idea of, of of making, right? And then at some point we need to compare it to something, right? Because it, this can become the idea of making, 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 and producing, like the a kind of a fab lab way of you know interacting with with material subjects and so on. Sometimes we need to compare ourselves or at least measure what we are doing regarding uh, the relevance of what we're doing, right? Um, and Angelica said say very precisely, right? First, I understand the context. Even I, I, the context could be whatever, right? And nowadays, I, don't, I think that we don't have much, much more time and we shouldn't have much more resources or, or spaces in order to design against nothing meaning that uh, we need to design against something, right? And for sure that we need to design against, let's say, environment, right? So that's the key issue now. On some cases, some countries, like we're all Chilean, but in our cases, we need to design also uh, to, compare, to compare or to, let's say, enable some social processes. But we, as when we are designing something, that we, when we invent something, these novel entities that I will mention, then we have a huge responsibility. We have a huge ethics behind, right? We cannot design something because we like it. We just like it, right? And that's be become is becoming responsible as well. So be because what is happening somehow when we are training students, when they go to professional work or to the academia or whenever they deploy the job, and actually in Chile we have a very interesting percentage is that only 13%, 40% of the students that study architecture after five years are working as architects. So we're probably not training architects, we're training people, <laughs> humans for the world, right? And if we train humans for the world, then we need to prepare them. And we need to prepare them to understand that context and to give them tools in order to deploy in an ecosystem, systemic way of understanding how society, environment, economics are involved into the designing process. So probably they will not design objects, they will not design systems, they probably will design, be designing other things. So I really mean that we should also take care about the impact of the things. Of course, that probably in the, the first years of understanding matter, understanding how ma materials are organized, 
we should be systematic and totally you're up to it. But then in a, let's say, in a more further steps, we should give this sense, right, of what we are measuring. And, and I think that it is crucial in the design practice, practice right now. My only, my only thing would be, sorry. Guillermo, yes. Yeah, no, just because. Diego, Diego. I just have a small comment on, 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 on that. Yeah, that this was a topic that we discussed in last um, edition of, of Cadria conference where I was invited to, to organize a round table around this idea of, of, of the responsibility also of, of as educators, as professional practitioners in, the, in this idea that, um, yeah, we, we don't have more time basically like how by understanding basically also like it, it goes back to this idea of like sprinkling uh something into your design to make it more interesting it's like how do basically we think in a more responsible way about the things that we, that we are doing because the impact of the things that we are doing spe specifically like if we still consider not only uh, design but also architecture that the construction industry for example is like the ones that are polluting like the most in the world also with the fashion industry and things like that um and we and it looks like i mean uh, probably it's, it's not always the case but it looks like that um to other disciplines we're just playing right we're playing and testing things just to see if something is like more curvy and more sexy or things like that but actually we're it looks like we're missing the the most important questions and one of the questions is like Everything that we do, as Tomas said, it has a huge impact. And this was addressing that discussion that probably you can find on YouTube because it was very interesting. And how actually from an academic standpoint, for example, we teach students that uh, what we do is not, is not trivial. Basically what they learn is not trivial and it can have a huge impact in the future, right? Because again, yeah, like here at MIT, like most of the people that study architecture they don't work also as architects they don't care they go elsewhere and they work yes. in like well, other organizations yeah. mm -hmm. yes. well, my, my well, only that, point I, with that more, more ingredients for you guys <laughs> coming from uh, from uh, youtube and we are well, maybe you, you can take this because this is, is a question that it maybe is, is following the same argument and it's adding more ingredients so uh, juan hernandez is, was asking about uh in, 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 in as being quite brief, uh, why in the construction industry, industry the adoptation of technology is, uh, is, is by far, uh, you know, we have a huge gap between the implementation of uh, our ideas based on this digital design versus the real, the real construction, the real design. So Guillermo, go, Sebastian as well. You know. <laughs> I, I want to say something about the, the, the previous <laughs> Thing. It's, it's just one thing. Yes, just go. <laughs> as as as, um, as as Diego said, when when you put ingredient, in, how, how is the name in English? The the, the word you, you said when you put a condiment, <laughs> sprinkle, like a sprinkle, just... uh, sprinkle something. Th yes. That is my point. But because if you put <laughs> re uh, responsibility design, sustainable sustainable design as a sprinkle, that is where is the problem. Uh, I, I like to transmit to my students that you have to, to, to use sustainable design or ethical design from your, from your base, not from your goal, not, not, it's not a goal, it's your, it's your standard. You have, so that is why in, during this, yeah. So that is why in, in our presentations, we don't put it as a, as a goal or something that we, we work from, since there, we, we can say. So um, yeah, that is mm -hmm. what the, the thing why we, I wanted to add to to the about the responsibilities yeah. or, or things like that. Not to it's it's like uh, when when you are a karate guy, you you hit more uh, before the the thing you want to 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 break. Okay, mm -hmm. sorry. Yeah. Well, uh, but about that was you are in, indeed indirectly you are answering this this uh, this issue that we are facing in, in our in, in our discipline versus the industry the whole industry because still we are uh, we are facing this problem between uh, what we are thinking what we are designing versus what is exactly happening in in the end in the construction sites so because yeah. still we have this huge gap gap and then you are explaining that maybe it's just because the 
the design is just a condiment that you know it's a sprinkle or something like that and nothing more and well it is, we, we must be fighting about what about this because in in, in the end we must do it <laughs> i think it's, it's not it's, it's because it's fair i think we are we are from, from the very beginning of our pro, of the projects the conception and in the end we are not just um, we are not just designing facades. We are designing architecture. We are designing space, and and uh, all the things that we are developing in the end are in benefit of the whole things, or of the whole system, not not just about uh, decoration. Yeah. So well, uh, in that sense, we still have more questions here coming from a YouTube um, channel. Uh, it's a question coming from a, a well. Do you think this is possible to parameterize all these ideas and? Uh, as uh, as a constructive method, how is it possible to do this? Yeah, no, maybe who, maybe Sebastian can can answer this as well because with, uh, mm -hmm. because if it's possible to parameterize everything or it's just it's an entelechia maybe that we can say yes. You can maybe you can parameterize everything, but uh, <laughs> the most to me the most important thing is to create the process that with with which you can uh, reach all the steps. Yeah, and do it well. So, but but I don't think that it's a very good question because it's a simple answer. Yes, you can do it. But uh, <laughs> to me, uh, if if I can take it on 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 construction, I guess that the for us the main I said the the most important uh, process in construction is the assembly inside, more than fabrication, more than design. So uh, uh, um, we used to work for that critical moment because if you have to design it, I can design it here, I can design it anywhere in the world, I can contract a digital parametric designer anywhere, so it can be a kind of uh, commodity. I can fabricate a piece in Chile, China, Australia, wherever you want, and you can make it. But to me, the most important thing is how you put it in place. To me, if I would like to parameterize something, is that part of the process more than others? Because if you if you read that goal, you can you can you can make the best project you can because all the previous process you can you you have options, but the construction set is just one, and that will be the most critical part. I would like to make it. We're working on <laughs> on the process to make it faster and better. Perfect. Thank you, Sebastian. I have here. I have a question that maybe is, is for, for Diego and Tomas. Maybe uh, it's like from Gabriela Perez. Uh, hello, everyone. How do you believe that AR and VR processes will uh, accelerate the completion of design, like an uh, everyday experience for daily user? Because it's still is something that is still ongoing, and how it will complement with digital fabrication. Hmm? I, yeah. I think that um, like AR technologies are like I'm not very into like VR but I think AR for example is something that it has a um, huge potential not only like on for example on, on, on BIM but like re relating this to for example what uh, Sebastian was was uh, mentioning about like deploying things on site um, it's very important. Like, uh, if 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 we are going to, and one of the challenges, basically, of like all of these things that are produced through like computational design, um, we have seen that we we are very capable nowadays to produce like anything that we want in a perfect lab setup, right? Um, we can fabricate basically anything. It it always comes to to the matter of like money, but there are challenges on how basically you can deployed or or basically like new methodologies or processes to actually make things better faster for whoever like people and so on and so forth so um i think like for example like the impact of ar is is huge because of course that will help with a, a lot of things concerning like from the like more optimized assembly processes to like safety of the workers and also maybe like realize, um, I don't know, things like energy embedded, like things uh, regarding like, like labor, for example. Um, like how many, how many workers, for example, do you need to assemble something? And you will realize like basically like overlaying new uh, uh, 
uh, information on top of your of your processes. So I don't know. I think it's great. I've been teaching that to some um, some workshops for the Bartlett around that, and yeah, apparently it's just like a great technology. I don't know what else to say. I don't know if Thomas has something. I I, I have a point in that uh, matter, if you mind. Mm -hmm. um, yes. That it has to be. I has to do something about the question that was earlier that we didn't answer. I think that there's some gap between design uh, or parametric design and construction that I don't know really where why is that big like how difference how much difference there is between the investments that seems to be for technology investigation and how different is the investment when you're talking about construction and to actually use these new technologies and I do find interesting that AR seems to be uh, skipping that bridge <laughs> skipping that like big gap that could exist and maybe it will provide the opportunity to live and use these new technologies and get it closer to actual people that can actually use it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We have several questions coming from uh, from uh, the panel as well from uh, from YouTube. Well, uh, sadly, we don't have too much too many minutes. Uh, but okay, well, let's let's, let's go for uh, the last one maybe. Um, this is a, a simple one, maybe. Um, we are fighting for people in all these things that we are doing. <laughs> and in the end, we are we are just doing this just for us or for 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 I mean, for, for, for 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 who? That's a good question. Hmm? Who wants to <laughs> take it? <laughs> As uh, George Carlin, the comedian, said that the fallacy of like all the environmental fight is not because of the planet, is because of the people. Mm -hmm. If we disappear, mm -hmm. the planet will endure and it will continue being the planet Earth, polluted or whatever. So I think, yeah, the fight is for is for us, right. not the planet. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, I think I'm not sure if we, uh, Giovanna, if I think if you think that we have a, a time for additional question or we, we must close now. <laughs> mm -hmm. That was an, uh, an amazing reflection. Mm -hmm. uh, instance because in the coast of Peru uh, we have a disaster with oil and maybe um, a lot of people try to to make solutions but uh, the real responsive responsible uh, don't have the, the the action that they need to do but uh, it's, a, it's a good reflection for all for all of us. And I think that uh, Carlos and Camila have yeah. some questions and comments. Yes, I'm, 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 but I'm not sure if can, Carlos must, must leave now the connection, but I have the question here. But maybe Camila, you, maybe you can go first. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, everyone. Uh, great presentation. Thank you so much. I do have a question, especially going from uh, the last thing we discussed about uh, whether we do it for humans or what are we designing for. Uh, I think that an interesting point to bring up is how uh, design in a sense shouldn't only be for us, but in also uh, to help us rethink what we are as humans and what humanity is within the context of uh, computational design. So. What is the question? No, I was just making a point. <laughs> okay. Yes, more. Well, and well, here I have a, well, the, the Carlos question because it's well, it's it's, re it's really simple, but it's really it's it's it's, it's really I think important is how how <laughs> uh, you got into computational design. <laughs> because uh, how is this, this is started? Because I think it's really important for all the of the whole audience. Huh? I'm not sure if you want to, uh, want to who wants to take it, <laughs> because it's, so, it's really it. simple, yes? I remember huh? perfectly the moment when I get interested on these issues. I remember I was with uh, our teacher in the University of Chile, Eduardo Lyon, in a course, yes. in a class of software, uh, using mm -hmm. Form Zeta, Form C, I don't know how to say, there was a command, uh, unfold. When, I, when you had a kind of polyhedron, you use unfold, and it opened up. When I used that, I said there's with there there could be a way 
to make what I see in the computer real, but with no drawings, but with attractions. <laughs> Yes. And it's <laughs> yes, interesting, Eduardo. Yes, our professor. Uh, Guillermo, or uh, Tomás, or Diego, <laughs> Angelica, Gonzalo. Uh, when? When we started? Um, no, no. Yes, yes. On, on how? <laughs> no, I don't. For, 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 for me and, my, and Tamara, also part of the studio was, uh, I think it was organically, we started... We study in a non well reputated uh, university called UNAC, UNIAC. Uh, but we had the lucky that we we received education from uh, many professors that went to Colombia, to uh, New York, uh, bah, to Colombia, of course, uh, to, to 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 United States uh, to study this uh, approach, digital design, and and things and. Uh, in that period of time, we received this kind of education, and it make it, it makes sense to us, and it's the thing we know about design since the beginning. So we can say when we when I don't know uh, exactly the, the the point, but is that is how everything is start. Mm -hmm. Thomas, maybe yeah. Oh, in my case, it started like when I was at school. Like suddenly I was passing into my almost last year in the school and I had to take courses, classes, like specific classes. And I took computation. We start programming in Pascal. I took environmental science and arts. And the school responses to that was sending me to the psychologist because I was, I was a lost case because everyone was preparing themselves to become a doctor, or engineer, or traditional architects. I knew that I wanted to become an architect from very young. And then after like 10 years from that, I was at IAC doing my master's in a class of programming, natural structures or something like that. So after like 10, 12 years, everything like uh, start becoming one only part. So yeah, in my case, I didn't knew that this will be coming to here into those specific things. But I think that environment, you know, computation and arts for me was very clear route. And I just followed that process and everything went to, into here. Then at some point I couldn't go back to become a traditional architect. Even though I do some regular architecture practice, I now can't go back anymore. I'm hacked somehow. Interesting. Diego? Actually, Diego was saying that one of uh, our first uh, fabrication classes was under his uh, teaching. Yeah, I remember we we make a lot of panels, uh, milling things there. Two thousand eight. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, for me it started when I was um, very young, probably like fourteen years old. I was obsessed with Terminator Two special effects VFX. I wanted to do VFX at some point also becoming an architect. So I started uh, uh, learning on my own uh, 3D Studio Max. This is 95, 96 when I had my first computer. So this is how I started. I was the, the only one doing renderings when I started my undergrad in um, Catholic University. And then, yeah, technology, technology was always present. And uh, after, even when I was practicing as an architect um, and yeah, here I am. <laughs> Excellent. Angelica? For me, it was at the university. I was there. I discovered Saha, and I wanted to just jump on that on that road. So, so yeah, it was uh, Saha inspiration. Saha inspiration, yes. And Gonzalo, yes, just for the last one. <laughs> well, I'm, mine is re far more recent than than the one from Europe, but actually it was with Sebastian and Angelica. Uh, first of all, was with when it was when I when I first met Grasshopper with Sebastian, and I thought that that was a perfect fit between the tiny part of my mind that I was wanted to be an engineer, and I wanted to learn about how to logic things can be built and and the beauty of doing it with Grasshopper. So. And then I met uh, Angelica, and that was it. Like we, I was already in there. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Well, uh, I have an ask a, a question coming from uh, Gustavo. I'm not sure if Gustavo wants to 
want to make this one or yeah or sure sure i just wanted to say thank you very much for the extremely um exciting and wonderful event today thank you tomas i i've been chatting and behind the scenes with certain people here and angelica and diego and everyone i just had a question um i'm very um impressed with the idea that we're having systemic global climate change and there are certain lawmakers and companies that want to exploit resources and the laws. Um, how do you see your roles as future leaders in this field? How do you tell your students to be both creatives, activists, and also strong leaders in their community? Uh, computation is just one part of, uh, and design mm -hmm. is one part of this component. Um, do you, what do you say, Diego, Tomas, Angelica, anyone in the panel? Can I answer that first? Um, for me, we need to speculate about the future. We need to think about that. We need to think about 10, 10 years, 20 years, uh, 100 years from now. If we don't do that, then we will never um, start working for that future. And you need to um, start thinking about the positive things that you can have and the bad things that they might happen with the climate change. So for me, it's, it's um, to vision that is very important. And that's why we, we do that exercise in the studio, actually. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Yeah, just to compliment, um, maybe think I teach them to think about like designers instead of architects, <laughs> like architects design a project that might become in the future, right, with some beautiful you know, renderings and so on. By designing, we do something. We do some prototypes and we start testing. So um, I, I, I also pursue them to think about future, but more to think about a dystopic or utopic futures, what they want to desire, what, uh, what are, let's say, a, a, a low signal of something that is happening right now, but we can't feel it too strongly, might become so might look like in the, in the far future and then bring that to the present in a design process, right? So instead of designing a future, we design an alternative present, right? So it's much more focused on present, how we can twist the present somehow, how we can do some small step, and then we see again, again, and again. So it's, it is an alternative process, thinking like designers. And also, again, right, it's not to, I forgot the Diego's word, uh, but uh, spicing the project is about putting the main goal in the center right it's in the heart it's the purpose and uh, never miss the purpose of the project yeah well thank and you very much uh, sorry you know? Alberto, that yeah. i caught you but to be radical about it i mean we can't be like just uh putting some spices in the project we need to go all yes for exactly it. yeah yeah that's the main change yeah definitely mm -hmm. we must go for that and from from uh, from latin america for sure we can do it yeah we, we sometimes we are we have this chance, or maybe we are super lucky to, to be part of Latin America. So we have the, this idea of the, being more re, re disruptive in a, in, a, in a good way. So we can we can fight for our dreams in a proper way. Right? We, we, are, we were made on that. So, well, it's, 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 up, it's up to us. Okay. Uh, well, um, Giovanna, maybe some, some final words as well, I think. Yeah. Uh, more than final words, I would like to to make a question in Spanish because it's important for Latin American people. <laughs> and, um, and I can open the discussion, a little discussion, but in sus palabras, ¿cuáles creen que sean las limitaciones para los latinos desarrollarnos en temas, de, en temas digitales, en esa fabricación o nuevas tecnologías y desarrollar estos temas en nuestros propios contextos? Eh, En mi caso, yo creo que una de las limitaciones es el idioma. Pero, ¿qué otras miradas ustedes tienen sobre este tema? Yes. ¿Debemos responder en español o en inglés? Sí, en español. En español. Whatever you want, yes. Yo creo que finalmente es... es eh, 
y no solamente para Latinoamérica, sino también para cualquier lugar que no es el centro de la producción en términos, por ejemplo, que tengan que ver con diseño computacional o tecnologías, es el, el tener una, una obsesión. El, es, es básicamente eh, ser lo, lo, tener un, una cuota de, de obsesión suficiente para poder ir más allá de lo que te puede entregar una institución académica. Eh, yo creo que hay una, una diferencia en lo que decía Angélica, por ejemplo, de ser radical. Es ser radical y también ser radical de una manera súper consciente en el sentido de que uno tiene que saber poner el, el, el valor de lo que está haciendo también por, por delante. ¿cierto? Uno no, no aprende o no, o no persigue, por ejemplo, el especializarse en un tema o el, o el, o el generar eh, solamente por un tema, como también lo decía Tomás, por ejemplo, por ego, ¿cierto? Sino que porque hay un cierto, una cierta meta. Y esa meta también tiene que ver justamente con, con cómo uno también se muestra o el trabajo lo muestra interesante para otras personas para que lo puedan tomar, incluso personas fuera de nuestra disciplina eh, y, y básicamente llevarlo a otro nivel de, de relevancia para la industria, para otra gente, etc. Por lo tanto, yo creo que hay que ser lo suficientemente obsesivo en una buena manera con lo que uno, con lo que uno hace eh, y siempre ser radical y continuar, continuar, continuar más allá de que uno tenga los recursos o no siempre los va a encontrar, si uno es bueno en lo que hace de alguna manera van a dar frutos. Excelente. Yo estoy excelente. completamente de acuerdo con, con, con Diego, y, y para complementar también, creo que es fundamental en eso reconocerse uno mismo, ¿no? saber qué es lo que uno le gusta, quiere, y no objetualizarse, o disciplin, autodisciplinarse en el sentido de arquitectos hacen casas, edificios o ciudades. Y eso es una verdad que no es así. O sea, eso no es una verdad que tal vez los arquitectos, los profesores de la época modernista que abundan por muchas escuelas de arquitectura en Latinoamérica, nos tratan de imponer, ¿cierto? Y eso no es así. Y al mismo tiempo entender nuestros contextos. Por ejemplo, en el caso de Chile, somos el país más alejado del centro de masa mundial. Es decir, somos el país más alejado de donde se concentra la población del mundo. Entonces también desde, desde ese contexto de ser un país esquina o una región latinoamericana súper apartada del centro de masa, es que hemos reconocer también nuestras oportunidades y no creer que las tecnologías digitales deben ser igual y uniformes para todos. Porque es algo que queda colonizadora de las tecnologías digitales, yo creo que queda un poco obsoleta con las nuevas formas que tenemos hoy de hacer. Entonces, como decía Diego, o lo que mostraba Diego, uno no necesita un computador para hacer computación, en cierto sentido. ¿cierto? Uno lo puede hacer a través de entender estos materiales. ¿cierto? Entonces, desde ahí viene reconocer ese origen, eh, con, con origen original, valga la redundancia. De ahí creo que es fundamental reconocerse a uno mismo y en el contexto donde, donde uno está. Perfecto. Bueno, eh, esto es, es, es siempre interesante como transición, como dice Neil en el chat, como de, a, la ses, a la sesión que viene el próximo viernes, que va a ser eh, 100% en español, de, para Latinoamérica y bueno, para todo lo, el mundo hispanoparlante. Eh, Nada más que agradecerles, ha sido yo creo un honor estar con todos ustedes acá en esta eh, primera sesión en, basada en, hablando en español, básicamente pues, comenzamos en inglés y estamos terminando en español y vamos a continuar la próxima semana y así vamos a seguir por cada, cada el tercer, eh, el, el tercer, la tercera semana, ¿sí? la, tercera, la, la tercera semana de cada mes vamos a estar eh, trabajando con esto. Eh, bueno, la que, la, la que viene es el 28 de enero, a la, en el horario que aparece en pantalla, va a ser eh, Digital Future World eh, en español, eh, Nuevas Hibridaciones Latinoamérica. Eh, insisto, este es el puntapié inicial para muchas eh, eh, sesiones que van a, van, van a venir, las cuales eh, están inminentemente enfocadas en cómo, desde, desde nuestra mirada... Eh, hispano parlante, es, estamos concibiendo el, 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 diseño, el diseño digital, insisto, o híbrido, o análogo, o la mezcla entre todas. Porque al fin y al cabo, eh, a través de las carencias que nosotros normalmente vivimos, como decía Tomás, que estamos eh, alejados, lo más alejados del centro de masa, se podría decir, o como decía Diego, no estamos en el centro de, de donde se, se gesta la tecnología, finalmente tenemos que hacerlo de alguna otra forma. Y, es, y esa alguna otra forma genera finalmente estas nuevas manifestaciones de de o estas nuevas miradas de cómo entender eh, los procesos de, de diseño independiente de la escala que sea. Vamos a tener una, una, una gran eh, conversación futura, yo creo, así que 
Otro tema eh, que también es relevante es que viene, el, viene nuevamente el, eh, mañana el Doctoral Consortium. Eh, el, el título es Do Robots Dreams of Digital Ship? An Introduction of Artificial Intelligence, eh, desde, desde la, la presentación de Neil Leach. Sí que están también cordialmente invitados, va a estar en inglés, pero por supuesto podemos eh, lidiar con eso si es que tenemos eh, las suficientes motivaciones. Eh, eso por, por mi parte, podemos volver nuevamente a, a todos los participantes para despedirnos. Y, y bueno, uh, let's return to English. Thank you very much for all the amazing presentation, guys. It has been a real pleasure to, to share with you all this uh, all this amazing production, I insist, uh, has been uh, mind-blowing. I, uh, for the audience, uh, um, I insist, uh, all this has been part of uh, this uh, this idea of uh, being designers in, from the from digital, from the analog perspective as well, trying to mix what we are doing what, from where we are um, and from from there. We, maybe we can do the things in a different way, in a quite provo provocative way, but with, with, with being super conscious about what we are doing. So and what we are making as well, or, or which dreams we ha we have for for the for the future of our profession. So thank you for all. Uh, has been a real real pressure. And let's be in touch for the next one. You are uh, you are uh, you can be in the next uh, in, in the next round in, in Friday if you have a chance for a more conversation because it has been really enriching for all of us. Uh, so uh, again, thank you, thank you, thank you. You are the best guys. Hugs, um, we can do it. <laughs> Thank you, Alberto. Bye. Thank you very Hello. much. Hello. 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 Bye bye. Bye bye. Tomás. Bye. Alberto, bye, bye. estuvo genial. <laughs> <laughs> sí. Uh, Acabo super. de poner en pausa. Sí, estuvo súper, súper largo. Uh -huh. No importa, pero parece, estuvo que, parece que seguimos en live por, por, por YouTube. Seguimos en live. Sí. Por... <risa> seguimos por streaming. <risa> ok.